Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Grace and I'm super excited for our video. Today we have Matt joining us, who's an analog engineer here at NI, and is going to be going through a product teardown of our latest power supply, R4150. Matt, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Matt, I'm an analog guy. I do lots of board level designs. Um, the latest thing I've been working on is the 4150 and 4151, which is our new 300 watt programmable power supplies in PXI. So today we're gonna to be taking apart a 4150, which is one of our new 300 watt programmable power supplies in PXI. So the 4150 is zero to 60 volts, zero to 10 amps, 300 watts. So that would be 10 amps at 30 volts, five amps at 60. Um, and we had to do quite a lot to improve the efficiency, improve the cooling to get that sort of power density in PXI. So I'm gonna start taking this apart and then we'll follow along the circuits with the block diagram. Okay, so here we have the backside shield off. Um, so there are two cards inside the programmable power supply. Um, this base card handles a lot of the backplane interface, um, memory, and then as we start looking forward across the card, um, we start getting into a lot of the measurement circuitry is on this base card. And as I take it apart further, we'll be able to see where the power path lies and a lot of the actual power stage circuitry, which are down on the other card. Now I can take out the base card. We can see both the base card and the channel card. Um, so it probably makes the most sense to follow the power path along. Um, so because this is PXI, we can't pull 300 watts from the back plane. So we do need an external 48 volt supply um, in order to deliver the 300 watts uh, to the outside world. So kind of following along on the block diagram first, you know, there's going to be some protection, um, a fuse, clamps, filtering, and then some active protection for things like over voltage, under voltage, overcurrent, short circuit, all that stuff to make sure that that is robust. So because we're in PXI and we're a pretty dense form factor, that 48 volt entry is down here on the baseboard. You can see kind of the fuse, the protection, and it's coming along through here to the standoffs, which are used for carrying the 48 volts up to the top card. That gives us a nice low resistance bulky connection. So coming back up, to the top card, we have the 48 volts coming in here and some filtering. So now I'm gonna have to take apart the top card a little bit more so that we can start looking at some of that protection circuitry here. Okay, we can lift this guy out of here. We can take away the secondary shield and now we're able to get at the other side of this top card. So that 48 volts is coming in here. Um, we do have a fairly dense design, so a lot of the circuitry is going to be packed top and backside. While we're on the top side, we can kind of see, you know, there's some bolt capacitance and some filtering, and we want to make sure that the switching power stage kind of stays confined here and doesn't really allow some of that, that switching current to flow back onto 48 volts. So I'm going to flip this and following along, you know, here's that 48 volts coming in. Here we have the protection on that port. Um, so you can see just the size of these FETs. Um, it is 300 watts, we're pulling a lot of current. Um, so you need relatively large FETs to be able to handle that and shut off uh, when the time comes. So I'm gonna take apart yet another shield. Again, we're trying to keep everything confined here. And then we'll be able to look at the heart of the power stage. So that is the last of the shields pulled off. So we've come along through here, we've gotten past the 48 volt protection, and now we're coming into the heart of the switching power stage. So following along through here, it's gonna come down into here. The first stage that we hit 
is a step down stage or a buck stage. So we have lots of nice ceramic close by, some fats, shot key diode. And again, we're relatively dense. We need to put uh, tall components on the other side. And there is the output inductor of that switching stage. That then feeds this transformer. This transformer is custom. Um, when you're handling a lot of current, you need a specific turns ratio that's relatively common. Um, you'll even see that because of the current and the switching frequency that we're at, um, you can see the secondary out here, um, and that is uh, made from Litz wire. So flipping back over, um, we can see the transformer drive. So we have kind of a full bridge of FETs in here. Um, we have a current sense transformer that's used for an inner uh, current mode loop. Um, and then poking through here are the pins of the transformer. So you can see it. we have a number of windings paralleled. Going back over to the shield here, one of the interesting things is this is serving a couple purposes. One is it's a shield that's both for kind of, you know, electrostatic. We've got switch nodes and things like that. Also for magnetic, you know, leakage flux from the transformer, the different layout loops that we have on here. Um, this material is gap pad, right? We have a lot of very uh, power hungry components that are dissipating. So we're taking advantage of, you know, kind of the bulk metal in the shield to be able to get some thermal coupling to that hunk of aluminum. So now we're about here in the block diagram. So we can move, start moving into the secondary side. So our secondary windings are coming up here and here. Again, we have relatively high currents. And so we have a kind of full bridge synchronously rectified secondary. So that is we have kind of four MOSFETs that are getting switched on at the appropriate time to get rid of their body diode drop. And then, you know, some filtering capacitance. I'm going to now flip back over to the other side and we can keep following along. We've got some more filtering. We kind of have a mix of ceramic and electrolytic, some inductors also acting to filter common mode and differential mode. And now we're into, you know, our final output filter, which is a mix of electrolytic and ceramic on the back. While we're here, we can talk about this guy under here. So in the block diagram, that is this block called the down programmer. And one of the things with the programmable power supply is we've got a big stage that's very capable of sourcing current. And we've got a good chunk of output capacitance that's good for low transients. But you also want to be able to programmatically go down in voltage as well as up. Mm -hmm. So what a down programmer allows you to do is instead of being dependent on whatever load condition that you have, our control loop is exercising this to also be able to pull down uh, with a limited amount of current and power. So this means that you know, we go up to 30 volts and now we want to go back down to 20 volts. We have something that can actively slew us back down in a timely manner. So now we're getting close to the output. Um, so again, we have a little bit more filtering, combo choke to knock things down, and then we get to our output connector. So the output connector is kind of a nice, big uh, blade style connector uh, that has nice low resistance. And so we've kind of followed the power stage path along to the high. Now we're gonna follow it back through the low. Um, okay. So on the block diagram, we come in from low and we get here to the output disconnect switch. In usual fashion, I'm going to flip the board over again and that output disconnect lives here. So you can kind of see it's four MOSFETs. This is kind of series in parallel. Uh, the main thing that this is used for is protection, right? We have some event, short circuit. Our current and voltage loops will react as best they can, but sometimes you need to disconnect. So this being solid state is very reliable. We can throw that often and quickly. As we keep coming along, we see that we have some clamping diodes. So this is to handle things like reverse polarity on the output, you know, really egregious overcurrent conditions and making sure that nothing disturbs the current sensing and the sensitive shunts over here. So after that, we get into this section, which is our actual shunts. 
and our read pack. So we have three different current ranges on this and two voltage ranges um, that lets you pick and optimize for the load conditions that you have and get you know, better noise and accuracy if you need it. So the 100 milliamp range is a small little resistor uh, tucked in there. Um, so it's going to be, you know, relatively low value, but not super low, maybe 5 ohms. Tucked underneath the wing of this heatsink is our 1 amp range shunt. So that's going to start being a little bit lower in value, say 500 milliohms. And tucked under this large uh, DPAC heatsink is our highest current range, the 10 amp range, which has like a 5 milliohm shunt in there. As we go through there, current times little shunts, you're going to end up with relatively small voltages. So you want to have nice uh, low noise diff amps or instrumentation amps nearby. Um, so underneath this guy is the uh, high gain amp for the high current range. And tucked out to the side is the gain ranging for the 100 milliamp and 1 amp ranges. So now we're going to start tracing things back to the daughter board again. The last little bit that we're going to look at on the channel card are these small little connections here. So we also have remote sense in this, which is to say you, know, you have a bunch of voltage drop in your cables that are dependent on load. And you want to be able to measure or control the voltage at your load and not have to worry about the resistance and slop here. So. These are your voltage sense connections to the outside world. They go through a little bit of filtering and are routed kind of differentially to our board to board connectors. So one question I had too for this, um, we call out that we have simultaneous current and voltage it measurements for these. Is that implemented in the same section of the board or is that in a different section? Can you talk through that a little bit? Sure. Um, so we have voltage and current and we actually have uh, multiple ranges for each. So when we follow this along to the baseboard, what we'll see is that we're not switching between ADCs um, or sharing them. We actually have dedicated measurement paths for both current and voltage. So kind of at all times, you know both your current and voltage and can control them with either constant current or constant voltage mode. Awesome, thanks. So let me shuffle these around so that we can start looking at the baseboard again. So here, this connector from our measurement circuitry passes a whole bunch of voltage control and measurement signals down through here. Those are going to route um, typically differentially into our different measurement sections. So over here, you see kind of this line of small parts. These are all little SSRs. We're using that for switching either between remote and local sense or switching between different uh, current or voltage ranges. So after that, we kind of detour around here. Um, and we have some more amplifier sections here and here. You can kind of tell they're laid out um, nice and symmetrically. That helps with common mode rejection. And these are all going to feed into our kind of measurement ADC paths here. So these two parts, uh, this one handles voltage, this one handles current. So we're looking at the current and voltage measurements and multiple ranges within both for each of these. These are a custom NI ADC, um, which is Delta Sigma like, and those are then digitized by our FPGA, and that's used in our control loops with source adapt, similar to a lot of our SMUs. The super interesting thing about this backend for the measurement side is it's very similar to our SMUs. So we get very good accuracy. We get a lot of the same features that we do in our SMUs, whether that's you know, source adapt, the ability to kind of customize your control loop based on your load, as well as getting an accuracy class that's better than 0.1% in all the ranges. So if we keep following backwards along the digital path, um, from there, we're crossing you know, back from our isolated side to our non-isolated side. So just like our SMUs, the output is galvanically isolated, it's floating. And so we need digital isolators to be able to send that data back um, to the backplane. Uh, on the non-isolated side, we have a, another FPGA that's receiving data, you know, formatting it, operating on it, 
and then going through another NI ASIC to talk to the uh, PCI bus. A couple other blocks on here. You know, as always, you need you know some block to supply power. That's not necessarily your power stage, but to generate a bunch of different rails that are needed by things. So that's this little isolated supply, little push-pull transformer. Um, then you have some more little supplies that are generating things like floating rails to be able to bootstrap uh, different portions of the measurement circuitry. On the non-isolated side, that FPGA also has a couple signals that come out to this aux IO connector. So this is used for things like um, triggers and inhibit and just a few GPIO. So that kind of sneaks along the top edge of the board there. And that is a walkthrough of pretty much the whole block diagram. I believe this will be accessible in a uh, more uh, a more visible form. <laughs> yes, we can definitely link it in the video notes. Um, it's in our user manual if you do want to take a look. Um, thank you so much for walking through everything. I just have a couple of questions as we're wrapping up. You've been working on this for a really long time. I'm curious what maybe one of the biggest challenges you guys faced when building this module, especially because we're putting so much in a two slot PXI module with so much power. Yeah, thermals are definitely a challenge. And there are lots of places you can see where we've optimized for thermals. So in a PXI chassis, the airflow is going to generally come from the bottom of the card cage going up. And so the most power hungry components or rather the ones that are dissipating the most energy are kind of up here along the top edge of the board mm -hmm. and here with the down programmer. Um, so we have to do a lot of things in terms of the custom design of this transformer to get losses down, you know, adding a uh, gap pad to kind of a custom heat sink slash shield, as well as kind of the arrangement of these, right? So the nice thing about having this towards the top of the board is that as you're using the power stage, you're burning a bunch of energy, um, mm -hmm. your airflow is coming from the bottom at something close to ambient. As it goes over hot components, it will heat up. Ideally, you want that to heat up and go out and not flow over a lot of your measurement circuitry. Mm -hmm. So intentionally placing things and thinking about how to cool things and where that heat is going was, was critical for the design of this. Oh, that's awesome. There's a lot on there. Uh, one more question before we end. Um, I'm curious, what was maybe like one of the most exciting features that you worked on in this board that you think is pretty cool? I would say the the time that we spent um, working on just getting this power stage to be flexible and work down to fairly low voltages. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of programmable power supplies that are one quadrant getting down to kind of a true zero volts is difficult. Um, and this can get pretty close. Um, you can go down to like 10 millivolts. So that's nice when you want to disable something or you want to stop powering something, instead of having it hang out, say 0.3 or half a volt, mm -hmm. um, being able to go down to a nice low level and still be in control is pretty cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matt, so much for walking through our 4150 today and diving into the details. And thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everyone.